Hey, what's up everybody? It's Saim Safdar and you are listening to the clownative.fm podcast hosted by Clown Native Islamabad. I am excited and thrilled to host this show for you and this is episode number 3 of clownative.fm podcast. Today is the Mar- is March the 9th, 2021 and in this episode we dive into Azure Arc, Azure Stack, Azure Stack SCI Azure Kubernetes service and learn and explore how you can build modern hybrid application with Azure Arc, Azure Stack, Azure Kubernetes service with my guest Thomas Morrow. Thomas Morrow worked as a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft as part of the Azure engineering team Cloud plus AI. He engaged with the community and customers around the world to share his knowledge and collect feedback to improve the Azure platform. Thomas helps the community and companies to transform their business to the cloud and make Azure the best cloud platform to run their applications. Thomas works closely with the community to promote Microsoft technology as a public speaker for Microsoft and other technical events such as Microsoft Ignite and Microsoft Tech Days. So let's go ahead and say hi to Thomas and cut it over to the interview. today and tonight we'll be exploring Kubernetes and Azure Arc with my special guest Thomas Morer. He is a cloud advocate at Microsoft and he's a former Microsoft MVP and I'm really happy he showed up um, and today I learned everything related to Azure Arc and Kubernetes and AKS with Thomas. How are you Thomas? How are you doing? I'm doing great, Aim. I'm doing great. Um, thank you for having me uh, on the show. I was really looking forward to that. Um, I hope you do great too. Thank you. Thomas, can you introduce yourself a bit? Because I need, I, I from to be honest, I think you don't need any introduction. All you have to gain tremendous amount of respect in Azure community, in cloud computing stuff. But some of them who are really new to this cloud and these kind of stuff, they learn more who is Thomas is, where he come from, where he live, and how he transitioned to cloud. Yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Um, so uh, yeah, as you said, my name is Thomas Maurer. I work currently as a cloud advocate at Microsoft in the Azure engineering team. And I'm based in uh, Switzerland, so like in the heart of uh, Europe, basically. And yeah, so it, my career kind of like moved from like being a IT apprentice where I did like system administration and like a, like Windows like server and client management. Did a lot of work on Active Directory and Exchange Server stuff to manage that for customers. Um, uh, which was super interesting uh, back in the days. And then I moved on basically to uh, work for a kind of like larger service provider in Switzerland, where um, we did a lot of work on like web hosting and email and stuff like that back in the day. So the company was kind of like split into two parts, if you will, um, technology wise. Like one was kind of like the Linux and Unix teams. And the other one was basically the, the Windows or Microsoft team, uh, where I was then a system administrator in the Windows team. So I needed to take care of managing, uh, especially our web servers and our uh, SharePoint infrastructure and SQL database infrastructure. And that was really interesting because it was like the first time I saw it, like doing everything at a little bit of a larger scale, right? When you work for a service provider, you probably don't have just one uh, web server you have like multiples of these and that is also when I started actually like investing a lot of time that was like again I think back then was 2008 2009 something like that uh, invested a lot of work in learning PowerShell uh, because I wanted to build all of that like 
automate as much as possible back then. And PowerShell was really new. Um, so I, I did a lot of work in, in, in the PowerShell community. That's also when I uh, started blogging about these topics. I basically just blogged about my learnings I had with the technology I worked, right? And so um, uh, I did all that work and then I was actually super fun to, to work that. We needed to do a lot with less to like make sure that like obviously when when you're in the working for a service provider, the IT is not just there to support, it's really to actually, you are the product, right? So that was that was also a lot of fun. Um, in 2012, I think I moved kind of like on uh, to a uh, consulting company, which was focusing on uh, Microsoft private cloud technologies at the beginning. Uh, so I mean, system center, Windows server, Hyper-V virtualization uh, and all that good stuff. And that was also where I came in. I wanted to do virtualization, a lot of virtualization work. I mean, I did that before at the service provider, but then there I wanted to go out and do different like consulting jobs on this. And um, so I did invest a lot of time in Hyper-V. And also in that year, I became a Microsoft MVP uh, for the work I did on Hyper-V, um, uh, writing about Hyper-V, talking about Hyper-V. Um, and so that was then on. And then after seven years, I think, uh, I was seven years at the company, I moved, like, uh, I obviously moved a little bit more. We were, the company was moving a little bit more into the cloud focus. So I come from the infrastructure part and then I moved like over to doing Azure architecture, Azure administration work, um, consulting company on Azure technologies. Also did a lot with Azure Stack because that was very naturally fitting in like between those two clouds. So I was like, doing the cloud things with Azure, but then doing hybrid with Azure Stack and like having that infrastructure part. Um, and at one point, um, I got reached out by my current boss, basically, from Microsoft, uh, if I would be not interested to actually work and, uh, at Microsoft and be part of his team, which I which was two years ago, and that was actually when I, I said, yes, yes, I want to do that because um, our our new mission kind of like as a cloud advocate, I get that a lot is, what are you actually doing, right? And so he explained it to me. Um, and on a high, very high level, what we are doing is we are, um, one part is like creating content and delivering content. And that can mean a lot of different things. This can mean we're writing documentation, we're writing Microsoft Learn modules, we're writing blogs, we're creating videos, we're creating talks and speeches and presentations. Uh, we're delivering these. Uh, we help people on social media um, to engage with Microsoft. And um, again, it can be a ton of different things. So like part being part of this blog po uh, this podcast, for example, could also be uh, counted into that. And the other part really is like gathering feedback. So we are part of the Azure engineering team. So we are not sitting uh, like in marketing or sales. Um, we are really there to help first, right? We are not like, like we need to go out and sell stuff. We really need to like, we want to make our customer more successful by using our products. And that is I really where we come in and we help our customers. Um, they help the communities to like, okay, like how can we make things better? So we got a feedback and we want to know from customers what is working, what is not working, how can we do better? And we can then go to the different feature teams within Azure engineering and talk with them and explain like what um, uh, we are doing. So basically we are an advocate for Microsoft within our customers and our communities. But on the other hand, we are also an advocate inside Microsoft for our customers and communities to tell like inside Microsoft stories of our customers and communities. And again, it's all about making our customers uh, and, and communities successful. Yes, definitely. But the point being, because I think Azure and Microsoft consider community as their part of product as well. So they included that, that this is our part of product to educate them and give them a feedback or reliable feedback, what's happening there, what they want us to do and how we be, are able to be more productive within their products, like gaining and providing the feedback and also a part of this they introduce a concept called microsoft mvp most valuable professional so some of them listening to this might be new what this mvp is but for me that's mvp is kind of a 
first things that Microsoft introduces uh, in the community and later on some of the AWS also adopted some kind of AWS Hero and also other products like Docker. They provided a concept called Docker Captain. So I think Microsoft introduced a tremendous amount of community efforts. They're part of doing a great job. So can you, uh, anybody who listen to us, what this app Microsoft MVP is and what it means to us? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... This is absolutely a great program Microsoft created back in the days. I don't even know how long it is. I'm sure it exists almost over 25 years or maybe even longer. And uh, what it actually is, it, it is a program where we or where Microsoft award, awards, gives awards to external people uh, for their work they're doing in the community and for the products and how they, they like share their knowledge, right? And we want to make sure that if there are a lot of passionate people out there um, which help others, which help the communities, which um, do tremendous work. They create scripts, they create tools, they create blogs, they create videos, they, they, they do speeches, they help others. That I think is the most important part. They help others to be successful. It's kind of like similar what we do in the advocates team, but they are not working for Microsoft. So they are really just out there, have all that passion about these products and um, with the Microsoft MVP award, we provide them with like a thank you, basically an you know, industry award uh, for their great contribution uh, to that. And with that award, uh, there comes a couple of things, right? It's not just um, a, a paper which says, uh, you got this award for a year um, or something like that. It, you get that too, <laughs> but <laughs> um, you also, get a couple of different benefits from it. So the first couple of them are obviously you can call yourself a Microsoft MVP, which opens a lot of doors for like if you do speeches and communities and all of that. Um, but then also it gives you benefits like for example, a Visual Studio subscription or uh, access to Office 365. So you can actually go out and try out these products and play with them without actually paying for them, right? So you get these, um, these demo environments basically, or these demo licenses uh, to actually do some stuff there. Um, and then what we also do is we actually give you a non-disclosure agreement. So this is kind of like a contract, an NDA, where it allows us to actually talk about secret stuff, which we don't want to share with the public yet. Like you, usually this is like early product stuff. We want to know the feedback on, we want to see what the MVPs are thinking of um, to actually figure out, are we going into the right direction, for example, or is that what we're doing um, uh, the, the, the wrong way, for example, or did we miss something? And that is actually great because with that NDA, like we can share information with them without they can't like them going out and everyone knows in the world what's going on. Because sometimes people are, what happens is not that we not necessarily trust people or anything like that, but sometimes we show like a product, something new, a prototype, and then people think, oh yeah, that's gonna be great. I'm gonna use that as soon as it's ready. But at one point we think, yeah, we're probably not gonna develop that. We have a better solution. And then people are obviously uh, surprised that suddenly this product is not public. So we don't wanna announce it to everyone what we're working on. Uh, that is one example. And the great thing about the Microsoft MVPs, obviously one thing they do is obviously like, again, creating content, sharing that, helping others. But on the other hand, they also provide a lot of feedback. So they, they I always tell like MVPs are our biggest fans as well as our biggest critics at the same time, because they really tell us like if something is not good, they tell us it's not good. and. That doesn't mean like we, that is something we like even more is like to actually figure out, have an honest opinion on something, right? And so we really appreciate all the MVPs and, and the work they are doing. And what I also have to say when I'm talking about the MVPs, I mean, I know that there are a lot of community people out there which do not, are not like an MVP yet, did not receive the award or, um, and, and that is not bad, right? This is, this is just like, there, there can be multiple reasons why this happens. Uh, to become usually an MVP, to be, to be nominated by another MVP or for a Microsoft employee. And then you need to basically show your contributions in the last year, what did you do and so on. And, and sometimes um, it's just like, 
it can take a while, right? It can take a while. It's sometimes like you need to wait a couple of years uh, doing great work, and at one point, yes, you now come in. So I always recommend people who ask me, how do I get an MVP? The first thing I tell them, well, it's not a short-term game. You really need to be like um, doing a lot of work over a long period of time. Um, it's not something you can like write blocks. Let's say like think you've learned write blocks for three months and then think you become an MVP. You need to be like really doing this for a while and actually showing that you have that presence. And I think that is that is the most valuable thing. Um, if if you can show that you do this, not just because you want to be an MVP, but be also because you have the passion for it, right? Because you have the passion to help others to make others better and help Microsoft uh, with their products. I think that is that is what is very important. And when we see that, I think that is one like of the key scenarios to become an MVP. Yes, definitely. I, I heard a little. I think Microsoft is more than a award, than more than a reward for you because you are engaging with people's like you, like Thomas Moore and other person who are working the inside the Azure team and knowing how what they are doing there. And actually, you are going to be a part of Azure team as well. You're outside the Microsoft, outside the Azure, but actually you are a part of Azure and you're providing the feedback and they listen to your comments, listen to their critics, and then eventually you learn by you learn by doing some stuff like doing some meetups, some conferences, some podcasts, some YouTube live stream. So eventually you gaining so much and you realize after the year that it, this reward that you get from in the Azure Microsoft MVP stuff is going to pay you a lot in moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I also quickly want to highlight, I mean, obviously I talked a lot about the Azure stuff, um, uh, but the Azure MVP, uh, the Microsoft MVP award is not just focusing on Azure, right? It really is across Microsoft. So we have, for example, MVPs for Office like Excel, OneNote, we have MVPs, I think, even for Xbox and Windows development and HoloLens and um, uh, just a ton of different different uh, categories of MVP. So you don't necessarily need to be like focusing on Azure. If you if you do great work in the office space and help people to be successful, for example, with Microsoft Office. This is also absolutely great place to be and you get the exact same award. Um, but just in a, in a different team, obviously helping with like working with that team. And I think that is pretty great. I mean, we, I saw a lot of people like they have the passion for years. There are some MVPs out there, there are MVPs for like 20 years. And what they do is just helping people be successful with, uh, with Microsoft products, right? And I think that that really shows the value of that award. Yes, definitely. And also from the, for a very long time, I've been a .NET Core developer and using C Sharp and other Microsoft .NET Core languages there. So there I see there's a tremendous amount of documentation around Microsoft products, whether now it's GitHub is acquired by also the Microsoft and you see a ton of modules in Microsoft Learn Academy that they have so many deeper dive content in there. So I'm really praised by the I really have I'm excited what they've done in the documentation space, whether they are Azure, whether they're Microsoft um, Office or Office 365 and other products, they all have tremendous documentation. Can you tell us to our listener what you did to improve your documentation and what are the team behind that and how you're able to do that? So that's actually a very interesting question. So we are part as Cloud Advocates, we're also part of developer relations and developer Developer Relations also owns the document Microsoft Docs, for example, and Microsoft Learn, right? So it's all of these platforms which you run. And I think there were some really great decisions done back then to create these platforms. And I always tell people, this is probably the best documentation we ever had uh, since I worked with Microsoft. I'm not saying that it's completely great, right? There's still a lot of work we need to do to make um, our documentation really, really good. But compared to what we had in the past, I think um, there's, there's some, some big differences. Uh, one of the things is like, um, as you know, the, how it works is that we, the documentation basically is all stored um, in, in, is written in Markdown and stored in a Git repo. And then it's obviously getting published to the docs website. So we do, a kind of, I don't know, a couple of different builds every day to 
get the changes in uh, into the official documentation. Now, the great thing about this system is that when you see something on the documentation, which is like not out, not not like which is outdated, for example, or not correct, you can actually go and make that change yourself. You can go. There's a small edit button, brings you then to the GitHub pages, and there you can do a change uh, on that uh, on that repo. And um, obviously, someone needs to approve that change. They're like the person who is in charge of that documentation article uh, goes have a look what your change was, and then says, "Okay, yeah, that's actually great. That's a missing piece we didn't have, or yeah, there was a typo, or there was a mistake, or uh, this is outdated, and it, you got the new one in." And then we approve it, and then a couple of maybe days later, or even a day later, your change is online in the docs, right? And so that is one of the big big advantages we have with this new platform is actually to allow everyone to contribute uh, and, and help us make our documentation better. The other part you mentioned, which I really like, is the Microsoft Learn platform. Um, and for those who don't know what it is, it's actually our free learning platform uh, where you, the only thing you need, I think, is a Microsoft account. And then we have different learning paths, not just, again, not just for Azure, like basically all the, like almost all the products within Microsoft or a lot of them, uh, they have learning paths. So you can say, hey, I'm, for example, an Azure beginner, um, and then I want to learn the, about the Azure fundamentals. So there's a learning path for that, which explains, like, really, like, goes through like, different modules. So you can say, hey, I have, like, a 30-minute lunch break while I'm eating lunch. I quickly go to through one of these modules, and then you can see the progress, and, and you, basically it's written text or videos um, to learn for that. Um, and then you have at the end, you basically also have some assessments where you need to answer some questions to see if you actually understood what 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 you just went through. Um, but the coolest thing I think, and again this is me, uh, is that we also have something called sandboxes. So as you know, if you do uh, work in Azure or also with other products, usually you need to have a subscription right now. So for you need to have an Azure subscription. So that means you need to like do a, we, we have some free services uh, which are great to try it out, but sometimes you want to play a little bit more and, and you obviously have some costs involved. You need probably need a credit card to open one up, um, which can all be challenging. If you do that with Microsoft Learn, we give you basically with the sandbox, we give you a free Azure environment. You don't need any credit card, you don't need any subscriptions, nothing. Um, and you can use that uh, for I think a couple of hours or something like that and just try out what we have there. And then actually there's a step-by-step -step guide and usually, and then you can go through and try out to deploy this and see how it works and how it looks like. And so that is actually pretty cool. So it makes it super easy for everyone to get basically started uh, using, for example, Azure, but also Microsoft 365. Uh, Dynamics has different things in there. Um, so uh, these two platforms, and they also work very closely together, um, are very, very helpful. And we try to publish more and more learning paths to obviously make our documentation better. Um, and obviously, if you have some feedback, everyone who is listening, uh, feel free. Check out the edit button on the docs if you see something. Uh, you want to have improved, or you can also just reach out to us and say, hey, look, look, that would be a great idea. Why don't you do this? And so on. Yeah, yes, definitely. I think learn Microsoft Learn Platform is going to be tremendous because it gives you a feeling of you can learn so many things and then apply those where you learn the concepts here in using the sandbox environment. So yep. 20 minutes over the talk, so let's stay in going to the first question that people are listening to us that what the containers are and how Microsoft gives some, some services so we can run the containers on them. And on the topic of containers, can you elaborate more about it, how they are different from VM and why they're starting up like a rocket? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so so containers are absolutely a, a, a great uh, technology, um, especially uh, for me, coming from virtualization, I, I really like to work with containers. And obviously in Azure, as you just said, we offer a bunch of different solutions for container um, hosting, but also like how to build containers. I can talk about that in just a bit. But yeah, so for those who actually haven't really worked with containers, um, think a little bit like 
look, if we compare it to traditional virtualization, I think that makes it sums it up. So it's kind of like a, a next evolution of that. So if you think in the past, like really a couple of years back before we did server virtualization, what we did was actually we had a physical box, which was the server. We installed an operating system on top of that. And on top of that, we were running an application. And then obviously we realized that like, if you have multiple applications on the same server, there were some conflicts and they were probably not compatible with each other. So what you usually did, like you went out and you had like multiple physical servers with operating systems installed and then some application on top. Now, the disadvantage of doing that was obviously that you needed a lot of physical boxes, which ended up like you spent money on that. And secondly, what, what, what the industry realized is these servers are then almost not utilized, right? The application is probably running um, a very low load, like you have probably two to 5% or even 10% CPU um, uh, utilization, but the rest is not really. So, and then you have obviously you can run Linux and Windows Server next to each other. Now with the container stuff, we're going a level higher because you still have now the overhead. So you still needed to run an operating system within that virtual machine, which you need to manage and also takes resources, right? Now, what we did is with containers, you basically virtualize the operating system. So you say, okay, I have this machine, virtual, um, have operating system on top of that. And then I split that operating system into multiple containers. They can all use the same kernel, if you will, uh, but they are still a little isolated. So they're not like, um, they don't have any compatibility issues next to each other. Now this has a couple of advantages. Um, first, they take less resources. So they're basically smaller. You don't need to pack another operating system in it. It basically leverages the operating system on the machine. Um, secondly, they, they get very, very small. So they have like, they don't need so many resources. They don't need to like, depending on the application, you need memory, but they don't have that overhead uh, in terms of space, in terms of memory, in terms of CPU utilization. So the advantage of that, they're um, obviously very small. So it's easy to transport them from one place to another. So you can easily share like a container or store it in a registry and then deploy it to another location. Um, they also, because they are so less, their operating system is already running on the machine. They start up super fast because they don't need to start the whole operating system. Basically, you just need to create that container and then start the application in that container. Um, and then there's a bunch of other advantages of, of doing that, like creating layers and, and, and stuff like that. And so containers are really a powerful tool. And again, I just said, by the way, I just want to be very clear here. I said that would be a physical machine and then a, like an operating system and then you have your containers. You can also put containers inside a virtual machine. So in that, in that sense, you get like the best of both worlds. You still have your virtual server as a container host, um, but you run containers inside that virtual machine. That's also possible. So it really depends on what works best there for you. Um, and in Azure, we obviously offer a couple of different services like AKS, uh, the Azure Kubernetes service, which allows you to run a Kubernetes cluster uh, for container orchestration directly within Azure um, as a managed service. So uh, there's, and there's a bunch of others like container instance, for example, where you can just, instead of like spinning up a virtual machine, you just quickly can spin up a virtual container in Azure, super easy, super fast. Um, yeah, and then there's, there's a ton of more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think Azure container instances, they are have to mean this because you can configure DevOps pipeline in it. Anytime a new image is being going to be are inserted or in going going to be inserted in the Azure container registry there. So it's watches the container is there and then it's eventually deployed that to the Azure container instance. So it's going to be a DevOps pipeline you can configure there. And I'm using that is going to be a very tremendous amount of you going the below of the burdens what you already have. So one of the best topic that is we see that is coming up in the I think Microsoft Ignite and at the other places that we see the, this the new service that we have the Azure Arc and I'm really impressed by what the Azure Arc does is for the previous day I've seen that it's just doing a GitOps thing but then I figure out no it's not a GitOps it's do going so much more than GitOps so can you elaborate what the first what the GitOps is and then what how Azure Ox is managing the stuff in the GitOps world or more? Yeah. yeah, so so imagine that like you have, for example, you have your Kubernetes clusters and you maybe have multiple Kubernetes clusters even. 
Uh, with GitOps, basically you store your application, like your containerized application in a configuration uh, in a Git repository. Basically you say, okay, look, this is my, my Docker file. Um, uh, this is how my application looks. This is what, what how it spins together. Um, there are the different YAML files for the application. You put all of that together, you put it in a Git, in a Git repository, and you configure your Kubernetes cluster to get that app uh, from there. And as soon as you do a change in that Git repo, it automatically applies that to the application running on the Kubernetes cluster. Now, this is super powerful, especially if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters running somewhere and you want to update the application very easily to all of these. Um, it's just basically a new, like a, a new pull request um, uh, to that Git repository, and after a while, the agents will get get that configuration down. So that is a super cool feature. Now, this is something you need to configure that, right? You need to go out and, and set this up and actually control your Kubernetes cluster. And as I mentioned, you can obviously run Kubernetes in Azure, but a lot of customers say, hey, um, we cannot run everything in Azure, right? I mean, there are many reasons why that probably don't work. Like, it could be like that they have data sovereignty uh, challenges where they're not allowed to store data outside of their country and we don't have a data center within their country, for example. Some of them, they even need to store it in their own company. Then there's like some networking um, and latency scenarios where, for example, you don't have good internet connectivity um, or you need to be sure that it's always available. Um, and then you also, you just want to run it in your data center or in your branch office or in your store or you know, wherever you need to run it. And so that is what we realize, right, with a lot of customers. And when I speak about Kubernetes, I'm not just about Kubernetes, it's also servers and all the stuff which, which we see. And I think that is one thing we did with uh, what we acknowledged in Azure very, very quickly, or as from, basically from the start of Azure, is that our customers really, that this is like hybrid is going to be an end state for our customers. Uh, and not just the in-between state until they move everything to the cloud. Um, that is one scenario. The other one is where customers say, hey, I'm going to use multiple cloud providers, right? I'm going to use uh, not just Azure, but I'm using others as well. Um, and I still need to control that. So that obviously, all of this, like the hybrid as well as the multi-cloud scenario, adds a lot of complexity and management overhead to it. So we said, okay, what we need to have is like two things. We need to have a control plane, like to control like your servers, your Kubernetes clusters, your applications from Azure. Doesn't matter if it's running in Azure, if it's running on premise in your local data center, in your branch offices, at your factories, wherever, or even at another cloud provider. You want to have that control plane. That that is one thing. So we want to make it easy to manage all that. The second thing is. If you cannot use an Azure service, again, for data sovereignty reason um, or network connectivity reasons, so you cannot use an Azure service in Azure, we will try to bring that Azure service to you. And that is what we have, like the Azure Arc enabled Azure services, like Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, Azure Arc enabled data services is a good example, where we try to, like people said, Azure SQL is great, um, we would love to run it in Azure, but like our our um, location is too far away, so our application cannot really leverage that. So with Azure Arc enabled data services, we bring Azure SQL in your data center. And so this is basically um, what Azure Arc does. It really is this bridge between Azure, Azure Resource Manager to manage all these resources, and resource, like servers, Kubernetes clusters, and so on, which are outside of Azure. And we basically do it in that, that we install an agent uh, on these resources. It could be, again, Kubernetes cluster or server, Windows and Linux. And then they connect up to the Azure Resource Manager. So well, the first question is coming out to the people in mind when they are using the Azure Arc. Let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster running with a data on-prem data center service there. So you can, in using the Azure Arc, you can manage their on-prem data center as well. As well and they can scale up and scale down. How to do that? Because this, this concept is going to be very, very exciting for some of the people who are listening to us. So yeah, you can absolutely, that is, that is the part of Azure Arc. You can absolutely take that agent, install that on a Kubernetes cluster, which is running in your own data center. 
And then it shows up as a Kubernetes cluster within Azure, right? You will see, hey, wow, there's a Kubernetes cluster and that is running actually in my own data center. And then you can enable like different services, like for example, let's say monitoring um, or the GitOps uh, scenario, which we just talked about um, on that specific cluster and, and actually manage it outside for like for using Azure. Another big part of that is obviously what you also get is if you're familiar with Azure policy, you can actually apply security policies to a Kubernetes cluster uh, in Azure. And now with Azure Arc, you can also apply these same policies to Kubernetes clusters which are running outside of Azure. So you can make sure that your clusters are configured in the right way with the right configuration. Um, and so you can make sure that this is um, working really, really well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a tremendous effect. It, uh, it's a, because it's going to be taking away the pain from you that you already have managing the infrastructure. Then Kubernetes is going to be a gigantic project managing the control plane and worker node. So it's going to be really so, difficult for the people. Yeah, so that is actually a good point what you just brought up. I mean, it's like the one thing is like with Azure Arc, you can actually connect any type of Kubernetes cluster. I mean, there is, I think we have some version restrictions, but a good point you just said is like, obviously um, the management of that cluster, right? We give you now some tools to manage that. However, it's still like, if you set up a, like by yourself, a Kubernetes cluster, it's still a lot of work to set it up and then also to manage it. So one thing we give you um, is, again, I, we, we spoke about this is, as you know, the AKS service, like the Azure Kubernetes service in Azure, which we actually fully manage uh, that in Azure for you. Now we have a new project uh, because customers told us again, as I mentioned before, they, for some reason, they cannot use Azure in that sense. They, like, they want to use it in their own data center. So we have something called AKS on top of Azure Stack HCI. And Azure Stack HCI is our to do virtualization. So basically it's a virtualization cluster um, where they can run VMs on top of it. And with AKS on top of Azure Stack HCI, we also allow you to install a Kubernetes cluster, manage a managed Kubernetes cluster, if you will, uh, on top of that. And so you can then use Azure Arc to connect it up to Azure and do all the management from there. So you don't even need to like do all the setup of the Kubernetes cluster, you don't need to like do a lot of management because again, we give you that that managed service. Yeah, I, I heard about this term for Azure Stack in one of the sessions that you're doing with Scott Hanson last week in Azure Friday. So I'm really impressed by the what you did there. You have some on-prem center that you have under your desk and you are the managing that <laughs> using the Azure Stack at yeah. So what were those if some of listening we're listening to us people who watched with Azure App Friday session because this concept is relatively exciting for so many people. Yeah, so so you mean um, what we can do in, in, in Azure? Like, uh, so the, the idea is that, again, um, I, I want to have Azure as the control plane um, to manage all of the resources, right? You connect, doesn't matter if it's running, again, in my data center, but also it could also be running here on my little machine here underneath my desk. And then you can actually manage it. It looks like it's an Azure resource, and then we can actually go and, and, and manage that. So that is that is pretty cool. So what I did there was I have my demo environment on a small um, computer here next underneath my desk, and uh, I installed virtual machines and the Kubernetes cluster on top of it, uh, and then I connected it to Azure Arc, and I was went to the Azure portal, and I showed Scott basically how he can now use the Azure portal to manage that specific cluster, for example. Yes, yes, definitely, because that concept is going to be a very tremendous in the, because everybody take, talking about that, we have a, a on-prem data center there, somebody managing that for us, it's going to be a, taking a pain all from us, rather than previously we're asking some third party to manage the AKS cluster for us. Now Azure has this built-in feature that they manage the AKS if you don't able to understand what AKS, they have another service there. They can manage the AKS underneath that and you are going to be relaxed all day, all night and as Azure is going somebody. So, so the last few points for, from you, sir, Thomas. If anybody listening to us and these concepts are going to relatively excite them, how they're able to learn these new things and where to go and jump there and learn new, new about Azure Arc and Azure Stack HCI and other products. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so definitely what, what I would recommend if you really want to learn more, obviously check out the official Microsoft Docs pages for these products. Usually you get a high level overview about like what, what is going on there. Um, and, and you can like even go then deeper inside every like how it needs to be configured and what it actually does. If you want to learn a little bit more in a good flow, I highly recommend Microsoft Learn. So you go to Microsoft.com slash learn. And that is where you basically find like learning paths and we have learning paths for Azure Stack HCI. We have learning paths for um, Azure Arc, including Kubernetes, uh, including server management, uh, data services and all of that. And um, so you can actually use these to go through. Um, and then obviously you can follow me on my blog, um, thomasmauro.ch, uh, where I usually do a lot of blogging and I try to like focus on um, not just how you use something, but actually how you can actually like enhance something and build something on top of it. Where I also release a couple of videos on Azure Arc, for example, um, or Azure Stack HCI as well. So these are the resources I highly recommend. So definitely, definitely check out Microsoft.com slash learn. Yes, definitely. And I, uh, I put all the links here in the YouTube. If you're listening and watching to us in YouTube, I put all the links here in YouTube and you can definitely go out and explore more about it. And the one last few question, I saw a new YouTube channel from Thomas Moore. What to expect is coming from this YouTube channel. <laughs> awesome. You saw the latest updates. Yeah. Um, yeah, I try to uh, like not just write blogs, right? A lot of people also like videos, like you do your podcasts and your videos as well. Um, so I want to do like some uh, how to videos on like how to do something, for example, in Azure, uh, how to, for example, like let's connect servers to Azure Arc, or also how to manage service in Azure. So I try to um, now release videos like more frequently. Um, uh, basically, I try to hit right, I think that now, like every Sunday, I try to release a new video on some interesting topic to show people what you actually can do with it. Um, and again, um, this is a, a first version of it. So if you have any feedback, please feel free <laughs> to comment on that. Thanks, Thomas. Really exciting. And everybody who's listening to us, and you can grab a link from YouTube if you're watching this from YouTube, and definitely subscribe to Thomas Moore's YouTube channel. I think the content is the go-to person for you if you want to keep updates on Azure things. He's blogging everything on Twitter and LinkedIn and keeping us updated on Azure because Azure is keep evolving, keep growing cloud, and you have to get you up to date on that. And Thomas is a person for you if you want to get updates on Azure. He is a person for you to connect with and learn more about him. Thanks very much, Thomas, for joining today. I learned so many good, great things from you today in our podcast session, and I hope you I hope to catch up with you in future as well. Having some another products and announcements coming out from uh, Microsoft Azure and doing another podcast session with you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm really excited that you showed tonight. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, really enjoyed it and hopefully we connect in the future and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. If you want to keep up what's going on in the cloud native ecosystem, we have a weekly podcast show on YouTube and SoundCloud by the name of Cloud Native Islamabad. You can listen for free every single week. We try to find cloud and cloud native experts, share updates on cloud native best practices, cloud native real world use cases, cloud native deployment patterns, cloud native deployment strategies. Topics include AKS on Azure, EKS on AWS, GKE on GCP, cloud native architectures, cloud native application developments, container containerizing application, DevOps and automation, cloud native certification strategies, cloud native career tips and more. So if that sounds awesome to you, head over to the SoundCloud and YouTube and subscribe to Cloud Native Islamabad.